Hey, Mike, how's it going? Good, Frank. Right on. Good to see you, brother. <laughs> yeah. Good week? Yeah, real good week, man. Real good week. Yeah? Anything yeah. cool or exciting happening in your world? Oh, uh, yeah, everything and nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all all at once. I got to ask Karen what's cool in my world. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Fill me in. Yeah. I what am I what, interested in this yeah, week? What's my week looking like? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I figure we kick this week off. Um, Frank and I, we like to kind of alternate between um, different teachers, speakers, scientists, yeah. physicists, you name it. And uh, this week on Perspective Shift, we're going to dive into uh, Mr. Edgar Casey. Yeah, Edgar Casey. I love and I'm it. excited for this <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, I love this guy because I've heard about him years ago and just dabbled in a little bit of stuff and then um, obviously getting prepared for the show about him. I uh, found out even more stuff they didn't know about. But yeah, it's really interesting. Um, obviously, he was born in 1877 in Kentucky. Yep. And uh, he's a farmer, a farm boy farmer. <laughs> he came out of farming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like anybody back then, <laughs> <laughs> like your role pretty yeah, much was yeah, farm. Yeah, you were a farmer, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, <laughs> there wasn't a big selection of yeah, uh, yeah, things to do. Yeah, yeah either you know, in the late the 1800s. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. But uh, the thing that's so exciting about this, like like Frank was just talking about, when we decide on you know these different teachers, speakers, etc., that we like to cover, we learned so much <laughs> from them, like individually, like Frank and I personally, and that's why I love doing this. Is it's like. Um, spiritual homework, if you will. It, it, it's yeah. really cool to hear the history, see how um, these different men and women played uh, such a, or had such an impactful role in uh, the development of consciousness in our um, three-dimensional society, the yeah. world that we live in, what we call reality. Yeah, and as we dive into Edgar Casey today, what you're going to notice is a lot of this stuff is starting to become real mainstream. Absolutely. But and this is the point I want to make is um, what right now are we discussing in the development of human uh, kind that isn't mainstream, but when you listen to it, don't deny it, but just expand because if you were around during the 1920s, 1930s when Edgar Casey, especially towards the end of his life, like he died in 1945, but he really became known in around 19... 19- 43 is when he just took off. That's when the newspaper article started writing about him and he blew up. Yeah, within two, and then, you know, he got over, over exhausted. I think he was 66 when he died. Which, by the way, they they talk about, I mean, like, that's like dying, you know, pretty damn early nowadays. Like, even back then, that was was pretty early. It was so early. So, um, but back then, this stuff would have been like, what? Like, so remember, and that's why we're kind of featuring Edgar Casey take is he, and the ideas of his, um, touch into the Kashuk records and we'll get we'll talk about that as well today but I want people to open up the mind and this I do that what are we talking about today that we may not understand but in 20 30 years it'll be like will be you know common com- practice common practice so keep an open mind because the people who actually kept an open mind back then is why me and Mike are able to talk about it today. Correct. He wasn't shut down and just buried. Well, it's funny. The concepts that we, Frank and I, discuss on this show, um, shit, we would have been burned at the stake talking about this stuff 100 years ago. Yeah. And it, like, that's what they were doing. That's what, you know, this was seen as witchcraft. This was seen as, you know, hocus pocus. Yeah, um, they, didn't, they didn't have podcasts back then, so we were lucky. <laughs> like, Seriously. You got to start a podcast. And, and what's a podcast, my son? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> but we're, um, we're seeing these, uh, you know, um, different changes in our collective consciousness as yeah. we um, expand and grow and yeah. uh, level up as a society. Yeah. You know, a lot of the concepts we understand and believe today um, just they, they weren't accepted 30, 40, 50 years ago. They yeah, just weren't. They weren't. And, and you, like even our parents' generation, there's concepts that they have come to understand that growing up um, were not discussed. No, no. And this is that evolution of consciousness. Yeah, so Edgar Casey. So he right now is known as the most um, documented, um, d- different Physics, words. Uh, uh, or excuse me. Um, psychic, psychic. Pr- prophetic, um, prophet. Sleeping Prophet, um, I heard that he himself would not go by those terms. Correct. But whatever you want to call it, but he is, there's over 300 books written by him. Yeah. There's a foundation um, that still exists today. Actually, they travel throughout the country, but um, it's in uh, Virginia, Virginia Beach. Yeah, Virginia Beach. 
Um, so this man has left a huge legacy in the time he's lived. We have a clip from one of that from that research center. It's yeah. called R A R E Edgar Casey's R Association of Research and Enlightenment. Yeah. So so we'll we'll feature a clip on that too, yeah, so you guys on. can yeah. dive more into this. Yeah, and I, and also too, as me and Mike uh, bring this up, so we're just like touching on this. We're not. There's um, a lot of information out there, so I suggest you go and look it up. Again, like I said, there's over 300 books, there's videos on YouTube. Um, if you have Gaia, yeah, there's a couple of different programs. Of Gaia. I think there's two of them on Gaia. Yeah, there's a few. But there's a lot of information out there about him. Um, and what it is is what he had said, and every person, master, prophet, whatever you want throughout history, always replicate this. And they said that, Every human being has the capacity to do what I do. Yes. They do. It's just you have to have the willingness to do it. And I think that's an important reason why we're covering it um, is. Edward Casey today. To and, show everybody at home, you know, what really and truly you are capable of and, and what, what lies dormant within you. Yeah. And what's cool today is when you start to step out of what you're doing, you just picture like Edgar Casey. Um, he was pretty psychic at a young age. I think it was like four years old. There was an incident on his uh, grandparents' farm where he actually watched his grandfather drown. He uh, went into the, there was a pond there. He went to cool the horse off, the grandfather did. And ac- actually, Edgar was on the horse, but then he took him off the horse. So he went into the pond to cool it off, and the horse got uh, disturbed by something. And the grandfather's foot got caught in the stirrup, and he drowned right in front of Edgar. K- you know, he was four years old. Well, from that time, the grandfather would come to him and he would actually tell him stories about like the Civil War. So he had these psychic abilities. I don't know if it was the, tr- the trauma. Like, we don't know. Speculation. But, yeah, yeah, speculation. They said it might have been a trauma, but I believe he came with him. It was just a kicking off point. But his grandfather would come to him and tell him a story about the Civil War and stuff. And when you bring it up to his parents, the parents are pretty open to it. Um, you know, but think about this. It's like when he was a kid, he'd talk and... Uh, you know, four years old has happened. So what was that? Nineteen um, eighty-two, eighty-one. No, 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 no. You mean eighteen? Eighteen. I'm yeah. sorry. 18, yeah, yeah. Eighteen. Yeah, because yeah, he was born in uh, eighteen seventy-seven. So four years old, and all of a sudden, the parents were uh, somewhat encouraging it uh, to talk about it. And I think it helped that his it was his grandfather because that connection his parents naturally had this attachment to. So they didn't want to be like, oh, no, don't talk about your grandfather. You know what I mean? And so this was easier for it to, to manifest into reality because yeah. that human attachment, just like if we have a relative or a family one member that's died and you say, you know, they're coming to you and speaking to you, nobody's going to put that down. There's no. like <clears throat> these different conditionings that we have in society, and this was one that allowed him to flourish. Yeah, they, well, they did, like, too, like a lot of people do, wouldn't want their kid to be harassed. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, they didn't worry about that. So he was able to express that. And I think because, uh, from what I understand, he was a, he was a, a very uh, kind person. He actually did, did for people. So that's the yeah. thing where people always thought, well, is he a charlatan? Is he doing this? He, he seldom took money. So I think when people actually doing him, and that's towards the end of his life when he was doing all these readings, uh, he his guides were telling him only do two a day, yeah. but he was doing like eight a day, <laughs> and uh, he was doing it because he felt the pain. And most of his readings are based on health, and people like having diseases, and um, and so he would come up. He would go into these readings. This is clear. So he would go into these akashic records, and people are like what are akashic records? Well, the rec there are records out there that are in the ether, in the sky, however you want to look at it that have information about our past, when I say our, individually and collectively, throughout time, our past, our history, and our future. All and, at once. Yeah, so people are like, how is that possible? Well, we've all heard the statement that everything, that it, um, there is nothing new under the sun. Everything exists now and forever will exist. So when you come into your future, the way I look at it is, our future is there. We always know that. I just haven't experienced it to put my, signature on it. I didn't put my vibrational frequency signature on it. But he was able to go into these Akashic records and he came out with medical um, formulas. Like, And he was not a doctor. He had no, no he, medical training. No, none at all. And so he was able to, on top of whatever the doctor was uh, prescribing for the uh, individual, 
he added this on and it aided in the healing of it. And actually some of these remedies that he came up with early in uh, the ni- early 1900s are still used today. Still used today. That is yeah. really powerful. <laughs> and, he, and he himself has no idea where it came from. It just came from the ethers of what they call the Akashic Records. And he plucked it out of the air based on the people that had the, the problem. So it was based on the people who had the illness, the disease, and stuff like that. He was able to see that. He also, I think it was, um, I think he said like 75% of his readings, I think it was over 14,000 in his lifetime. It's a lot. That is a lot. Um, but uh, 75% of them were based on health. Correct. Uh, yeah. Majority and, were on yeah. health. And he then wanted then, to help people. Yeah, yeah, and the other ones were based on like, uh, you know, um, you know, when's world events, world events. There was a, there yeah. a bunch. See, the thing about Edgar Casey is like, they, they say like he was a psychic, like a medium who channeled, you know, a, a, a giant spectrum. It wasn't just like, okay, I, you know, I can talk about this. It was, no, yeah. you could bring any type of question to him. And yeah. he had this ability to channel and, and uh, step in or even access the consciousness of a specific individual in a different uh, spectrum spot of the world yeah and even as as we know today we still don't know anyone that does it in that broader perspective yeah yeah, you know, yeah. Again. there might be i'm sure that yeah. exists yeah it does but maybe they're not as famous um, that's it yeah so i can't say that he isn't but till date like a lot of people say they they think he's the only one that had that broader perspective so he could talk about health he could talk about science he could talk about where the where to dig for oil so yeah. to speak and, and and guys like he was decades years ahead of like <clears throat> Uh, himself you know back then like he was tapping into uh, events that were going to happen in the future and the accuracy of these predictions yeah. what is uncanny like well, yeah some of that's the thing is some of them though like they looked at it they weren't as accurate as we thought but then there were people talking about the accuracy it's like okay a lot of times when he was talking about it, it was more it could have been more metaphoric about the structure change of the earth and stuff like that some of that stuff didn't come true but then they said, well, if you look at it differently, because when, when he predicted this would happen, it was right before World War II. So the sinking of Japan into the ocean could have been metaphoric because it entered into the war and it got decimated um, with two atom bombs, right? So he's, the guy says, like, that could have been how he read it, but he's just reading it off of a thing. Because like, he has no... Like, Edgar Casey, the man, had no interference. He was completely out. They actually, they had doctors come in to see if he was real. And when he was under, they would take needles and prick him with them. Never flinched, didn't bleed, you know? But <laughs> he said when he came out of it, he was done. Like, no, I'm not a yeah, testing kid. But exactly. it gave legitimacy, at least to those um, doctors that realized when he was under, he was under. That's it. He, he, he stepped, went into a total trance state. Yeah, he was stepped aside. So Edgar Casey, the person, the man, had no influence on the information coming through. And he said that. Yeah. He yeah. recognized that. He said yeah, when he, he'd come out of a reading. He didn't remember anything. Yeah. What did I say? <laughs> yeah, to hope it worked, right? Yeah. Did, did you get anything? Yeah. You know, that's I, like how he would act. I say it to Karen every day. Did you get anything out of this? <laughs> <laughs> you getting anything out of this? It's like you're saying we, nothing. Very cool. <laughs> you're saying nothing, you idiot. <laughs> so I'm like the opposite of Edgar Casey. <laughs> Anything that says, just do the opposite. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So one thing about Edgar Casey, um, too, back, you know, in this time, uh, you know, timeline that we're, we're discussing, um, is there's no actual recordings of Casey that are, you know, that you can just pull off of YouTube. Frank and I were trying to find some, like, actual uh, recordings of Edgar, or excuse me, Edgar Casey speaking himself, and it was very difficult. And we found one um, that happened to be featured on Gaia, and it was simply him um uh in a trance state uh p- providing like a, a a remedy and so it was like a list of different you know um uh like uh, ingredients hazel. yeah yeah it, witch hazel you know all these Pure types of things oil. yeah exactly and these little <laughs> components to a remedy you know like a um uh uh, for health and so we're not going to feature that today so we found some different uh stuff on the history of edgar casey that we wanted to share with you and then we also found um uh, from the edward casey foundation the are that we mentioned in the beginning of this episode the association of research and enlightenment some of the concepts that they touch on because what's cool is uh here we are 90 years later and not only are his readings still being used by people uh to this day 
but um, the the ideas behind his readings are being fully embraced and uh, legitimized in modern day science. And this is so cool to see, um, you know, this span years and decades and to hear a gentleman like this um, with a background of Christianity, uh, like he was a Christian. And so he taught Sunday school. Great guy, right? And um, Yeah, he read the Bible like yeah, 60 times. He, he was a big Bible reader, all this. And yeah. when he started to kind of channel into, you know, these, uh, or when he started to channel and, and do these and go deeper into um, remedies for individuals and tap into their consciousness, he began to see past lives. And then that's when reincarnation came up. And reincarnation, I don't know how many of you have been raised Christian or Catholic. I myself was raised Catholic growing up. Uh, but these concepts are not only not discussed, but they're shooed away, and we are conditioned to believe that they do not exist. But, but they actually do exist in the Bible, though. Absolutely. They just don't use the word reincarnation. The way that yeah. we are explained the yeah. Bible, the way we are taught, reincarnation is not an element of modern-day Christianity or Catholicism, well, and it, it needs to be. You know, it, it's starting to change, because everlasting, uh, everlasting uh, life is the understanding, of, and it's— you know, it's more of like you say reincarnation. It's actually multiple, uh, multiple simultaneously incarnations. Because it's all at Cause, the same yeah. time. <clears throat> well, because there's no re. Like you have somebody like you know say, okay, I'm a reincarnation of this person, but you aren't that person. You're actually maybe channeling information the same way where they got it, but you have your own signature. You have different fingerprints. So you're an incarnation, not a reincarnation. Gotcha. It's like yeah. watching the same movie over and over. So. <clears throat> There's, uh, you know, there's a couple of people talking about that. You could channel other information into. So we're actually incarnations, but because we're experiencing this information now, it isn't a redone. It's not like a rewatching the same movie. Mm -hmm. It's an extension. It's like a part part two of Rocky. Yeah. <laughs> Rocky Hell yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because that, that that is true. Like when we come here, we're not coming back as the same person. We're coming back here to le to learn and remember what and who we are. Yeah. And, and from a um, new perspective, if you will. Yeah, and some people have the trail of information, so it's a continuum of where they left off, yeah. not reliving that life. Hence why we can remember past lives. Yeah, so you don't need to relive the person that they came back as. There, There's just a continuum. And a lot of us are all continuums. We don't know how many lives we've lived. Some people have direct relationships that I've talked to. I personally don't. I had like um, past life aggression readings. And the only connection I have is during the reading, I went into two lifetimes. One, I was uh, a Native American. I seemed to be, you know, I was just in a village or whatever. It was tough to tell what my part was. I just remember walking around. The other one was, um, you know, um, I was a horseman in the Khan period. Really? Like, yeah, Genghis Khan period. So in the Khan Valley. And there I was a warrior of some sorts. And so I thought that was interesting when I had this past life reading because about five years prior to that reading, I had a dream. And it was the first dream I ever had. Like, I'm having to have these violent dreams where someone's chasing me, trying to stab me, shoot me, whatever have it was. And right when I got stabbed or shot, I woke up. So I never experienced the actual death process. Or maybe that was a death process. Who knows? But this one dream I had where I was being chased, it was me and two other guys and I was in the middle and the other two on the side and we were on horseback and we're running from like an army of like over 100 guys just coming at us. And I came up to a mesa. There was nowhere to go. It was just a gorge. So I bow faced and I bow faced my horses in front and the other two were slightly behind me almost in a triangulation. And I dismounted my horse. I walked up and the leader, whoever it was on the other side was out front. He got off his and I went down, I got on my knees, and he pulled the sword out. Next thing I know, everyone was looking at me. I got back on my horse and just simply rode off and went right between the army with my horse. I, never, I didn't wake up. That's how the dream ended. I just got goosebumps. That was so, a cool story. <laughs> so that was, a, that was the first time and the last time I was ever in a violent, uh, somewhat of a violent or erratic uh, dream. And... I didn't wake up from the death. So I don't know what happened. Did I die? Did I not die? Did I cut my head off and I turned it someone's? I don't know, but it was the last time. And then fast forward uh, five years later, um, I had a reading and I was in that calm period. I, that event didn't come up. 
so I'm like, okay, there's something there, and maybe it's because like totally, yeah, like uh, one of the, the things um, I'm learning to get over and working on it greatly is um, aggression, anger, like Ur, like you know, yeah. I grew up in a world like I came into this world as a young boy, boxing. That's why you incarnated in New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, my, like I remember. Uh, Everybody even, in New York is pissed yeah, off. Even, <laughs> yeah. And, um, but yeah, what I, what I found, like, when I was a kid, like, even before I can talk, my dad was showing me how to turn my fist in. Yeah. Hand, boom, like that. I remember this. And, but the one thing I learned um, that, like, if I, like, I knew how to fight as a young kid, and very few kids did. I never like to fight outside the ring. In the ring, it's it's a sport. You have no animosity against a guy. It's just, you know, whatever. But whenever I got into a fight outside the ring, I felt like throwing up. It didn't feel good. And I would ask, like, I didn't say anything to people because I didn't know, you know, how they felt. So I, I, I looked at some people. They looked like they enjoyed fighting. I did yeah. not. And some people do. So I don't know if it's like, okay, now this is a lifetime. <laughs> and again, that's how I'm putting it. This is a lifetime in which I need to get over that and get rid of the anger because it, it doesn't serve me. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's my... That's really cool. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's cool or not. It's well, no, you know, <laughs> I mean, just the awareness. It, yeah, the awareness is cool because I realize, you know, again, why are we here? Are we overcoming karma or whatever it is? And it's like, yeah, perhaps, you know. I, I can't, you know. I, I really believe we are here to remember who we are. <laughs> yeah. And, um, we don't have a, a, any idea of like a purpose and all that. I feel like that's all mind. Yeah, and and the way I use it, like and used it in the past with the fractal understanding of how life re, uh, represents itself. And what I mean, if everything's a fractal, look at the lives of like actors. A great actor will play this role, this role, this role. They'll play actor from like you know, they'll play somebody that's say a stoner in a movie. Yeah. Jeff Spicoli. Hell yeah. Hell <laughs> and then yeah. he's in a series where he's an astronaut. Yeah. So, Good and then, example. and the, the vast majority of roles that Sean Penn had played. So Sean Penn would be like the spirit or the uh, the soul and all the roles they played because a great actor could play every role, get into the role yeah. and detach, get in and come out, get in and come out to fulfill something. And, but yet, the choice being done by the soul is allowing it to fulfill something. What is it trying to fulfill? It's a timeline of stories. And I believe at the end, part of getting beyond the karma, and actually they talk about this with Edgar Casey, was that will close the Akashic records for you. But then that guy, uh, the guy who runs the organization now, that Kevin. Kevin guy? Yeah. yeah, I can't remember his last name. Yeah, he's not, His last name isn't Guy, but we just call him Kevin Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Easier to remember. Yeah, yeah. But um, then he believes, I, I, I agree with this when he said this, he goes, um, I believe then once we, we get over our karmic, then we want to go back to help others. Yeah. And so now, so one could say like the Buddha or Jesus, especially Jesus, like in, you look how you look at him, he came in with no karmic background, but he came here to help. And that's why he had the ability to know that. And it's cool because one, the more I know, and I see people in, in like fear of stuff and stuff like that, I can relate to that because I remember being there, but I, I can enter into a very calm disposition. I'm like, there's nothing to really worry about. But just saying those simple words doesn't help them. But my simple, calm disposition, absolutely, it's does. contagious. And um, actually, one Edgar Casey's son re- re- said this. I think his dad was the one who said it. He goes, your frequency or your output can either heal somebody or harm somebody. It's doing either one. So check yourself. What do you choose? Yeah. yeah. So That's one of my yourself. favorite things about that. I love that. So when you walk into a room, when you, you're either harming somebody or you're helping somebody. Or healing. Where do you want to be? Yeah. Which side of the uh, history Coin. do yeah. you want to be on? Exactly. But so, that, that is so true. Check yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, and I think about this every day and like yeah. in my working life, you know, when yeah. I go out and I'm interacting with clients, am I helping or am I hurting? Yeah. So I, every morning I check myself because now that like I'm overcoming the anger, um, like I'm, I'll still get into anger. But what I, I now know to do consciously, I don't put myself out in the world. I don't get near somebody. You know, sometimes I can't because Karen's right next to me. <laughs> like, What's wrong with you? I'm like. I grew up in New York. I had a paper route. What the hell do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> the conditioning is real. Yeah, the she's conditioning like, what does the paper route have to do with it? I'm like, it has everything to do with it. Freaking got dogs chasing you. It's cold out. 
you know, pissed anyway. off people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the conditioning is is real. Yeah, she didn't get the paper route connection, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I'm like, you know, if you had a paper route, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Should we uh, dive into a clip? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do this for. Um, so this first clip, what do we got? This one here is, um, they're actually explaining how Edgar goes into the Akashic Records. Uh, uh, sweet. We'll let the video do its talk. Sweet. It's explains better than we do. Well, I do anyway. There we go. Casey's readings, which were expanding in detail and scope, were also encouraging. He began to describe as best he could the journey his consciousness would take when in trance. He would describe moving up through a beam of light, passing images and sounds, and his consciousness moving to other dimensions that are related to vast sources of information. Casey called this source of information the Akashic Record, where every thought, sound, or event from the beginning of time is recorded. He believed he could access this resource as well as his subject's subconscious mind telepathically to answer any question posed to him. The concept boggled the mind, then as now. That this man would lie down on a couch and essentially go to sleep and come up with this information, it's just too big a jump for lots of uh, scientists and trained medical professionals today. Edgar's personal life readings indicated 17 different incarnations as a high priest in Egypt, a nomadic ruler in Persia, and in the fabled Atlantis, which he mentioned nearly 700 times. He described a highly advanced society that collapsed over a span of 40,000 years, with its survivors settling partly in Egypt. Casey, nearing 60, seemed to sense his time was limited. Readings of past, present, and future were now spilling out. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was really good. And also to mind this clip um this documentary was done in twenty twelve. Was it? Yeah. Okay. So we are what, uh, ten years. Yeah. So even in ten years, it's amazing what science is now looking at as valid. Absolutely. So to show you, just from like, because when that guy mentioned that science is still not even, well, yeah, yeah, good point. Because like, okay, so now through um, neuroplasticity, uh, through uh, quantum physics, through epigenetics, all of these modern sciences are now not only validating claims like this from people like Edgar Casey, but they're expanding upon them and showing how it actually works like how the math works and this is this is very powerful stuff guys because we now have modern science backing up what mystics have been telling us for millennia yeah and that's uh, we say this we're going to say this time and time again on the show and this is what me and mikey here to do is so everyone that we feature and even in in the past we were just talking about these concepts that there is a correlation there's an under underlying theme in every one of them that's the same there is, that doesn't waver. It's Edgar Casey the way he's going into a trance, opposed to uh, some quantum physicist that's studying it through cell biology. Uh, uh, Albert Einstein yeah. answered the or accessed this same yeah. source that we're talking about. Yeah, this Albert Akashic Einstein, record. and then you know quantum physics from Niels Bohr yep. um, came in. So how they use it, how they told the story about the energy field is different, but they're talking about the same. They're telling. They're talking about the same story. Yes, just differently. So consciousness is fundamental. Yep, exactly. And what's happening and how it works. So when I, you know, what I like to do is when I read books now and look into stuff, I'm not looking to regain new information. I want to see the connection to everything. Connect the dots. Yeah. So when I see the connection, the correlation, and the reason I keep doing this, it just keeps reaffirming it. And I have to re reaffirm myself every day because the old programming wants me to be separate. I'm like, oh, shit, I got this today. I'm like, everyone on the planet's got this day. They got to get up and out of bed and breathe. What's those? It was like almost when COVID hit. Yeah. And all of a sudden, um, a lot of people's um, initial reaction was to complain. I'm like, I'm like, the whole world's the choir now. What the hell? You, who, like, you can't complain about COVID because yep. everyone's dealing with it. So you start to realize that if everyone's dealing with COVID, you can't complain. Just go forth and do what you can to do best. 
And now we're at a time we realize we're all connected. What am I complaining about? Because as I'm, a, I'm waking up to this, I'm like, I can't complain. There's no one to blame. I'm the one projecting the picture. And if I don't like the movie, it's like the director complaining to the producer, I don't like this shit. The t- producer's like, you directed it. What do you want from me? Change it. That's it. Or overcome it and look at it differently, you know? So we realize we're the ones shooting ourselves in the foot and wonder why we're limping around is the problem, waking up to it. I'm like, yeah, stop pointing the gun at your foot. That is the, the waking up point, you yeah, know? We, we, we start on like a physical level and we start to understand like our senses and we're like, okay, we get get in tune with our body enough when an emotion kicks in, we're now aware enough to say, okay, that emotion is not my, I, I am not that emotion. And we allow ourselves or this space to not identify with emotion anymore, mm-hmm. but um, realize it and interpret it as the sensation. Mm-hmm. And that then translates into like a new mental level and so like you go from this like physical awakening to like this mental awakening to this spiritual awakening and it's like these at least this is how i experienced this type of process but you start to to see that how we have been processing information our entire lives has been creating this web that we call reality yeah so again if anyone's like they peak interest in uh, diving deep into Edgar Casey, what have you. And I encourage everyone to, to look into it if they want to or somebody else. But remember, if you're in an airplane, do not rely on someone else letting you or telling you that you actually have a parachute on your back. You have to know the parachute's on your back before you leap out of the airplane. It is no one else's job. And this is how I look how cults start. The cult leader is the one lining up people at the door and saying, jump, don't worry, you have a parachute on your back. And they don't. No one should tell you how you should feel, what you should think. But the pre- presentation of this stuff, how does it relate into your world? How does it relate right into your life? How, how does, does it feel? How does it feel? Now, when I know I have the parachute on my back, the enjoyment of jumping out of the airplane is exciting because I know I have it. I, when you come to know this stuff, then you jump out of the airplane. Then you leap into it. So work on to coming to know it for yourself rather than just taking Mike's word for it, my word for it, or Edgar's word for it, mm-hmm. or anyone we feature. But when you see this, you'll see the correlation. You'll see how we're all connected. I love that, Edgar. You know, one thing that he talks about, you know, as far as accessing this Akashic record, um, this uh, psychic ability, this channeling ability, this telekinesis, all these different concepts that he's discussing, one of the things that his readings keep bringing back um, to us is everyone has these capabilities. Yes. We all do. And so, like, Frank and I, um, from a 3D perspective, we're pretty normal dudes. <laughs> you know, we're, we're working, you know, <laughs> we work, we got jobs, through. you know, all this type of stuff. And yeah, so, M- like... Michael, Mike's doing that normal analysis because... This is how, but other people are like those guys are funny. <laughs> <laughs> These dudes are not normal. Yeah. No, but like if you if you were to interact with us, you know, in yeah, yeah. reality in this matrix, you know, you wouldn't be like, oh, these are very spiritual, woo woo, you know, type of guys. And it's no, yeah. and, and that's something we want to convey is these concepts are not uh, crazy. These concepts are not out there. They're more mainstream. How we were yeah. taught these concepts and how we were conditioned to look at these concepts have kept us separate from them. And so we have all this innate extreme power within us. And we have these capabilities that uh, to, to perform these type of things and to um, allow people to, you know, not access them or think that they're, you know, they're non-existent or the, they lay dormant. And that's uh, a huge crime to this experience that we call life. Yeah. Like, so how I like to explain this is um, we've got like this left brain and this right brain, right? And so we grow up in this left brain society where we are uh, taught that if we cannot measure this, if we cannot recreate this, if we cannot produce it, then it is not real. And this is not true. Um, well, how do in, we know that? Because everything that we're measuring once didn't exist. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Well, <laughs> quantum physics has proven yeah. that once we measure is when we take a wave and break it down into particle, collapse the wave into particle, and then we have matter. And this has been prov- proven, you know, scientifically speaking, and recreated and duplicated, et cetera. So 
that this um, these experiences, in order to access them, it's not like you need to to do anything. It's more of a undoing of the beliefs that you are not accessing. And so you start to allow, and I'm doing this personally, by the way, guys. Like for me, over these last few months, I, I've realized, man, there's this like whole uh, metaphysical realm out there that I am not participating in. And the reason I use the word participating in that is how you access it. So it's not something you're born with, or it's not something some people are born with. It's not something that only a select few have. It, this, we live in a participatory universe. And so if you want to experience, if you want to channel, if you want to have these capabilities, you must learn to participate in them. It's very similar to like meditation. There, when you, actually, yeah, there, we but, actually, everyone has access to them. We at, just, yes, absolutely. The thing is, is when things happen, you just write it off. That's it. We yeah. say that's not all. That's people just... have psychic. We were, a lot of children had them, and we didn't write them off. It's like how a kid. Could Why do we do that though? Conditioning. We're taught that way. Yeah, you are told just ignore that. Yeah, like do that. and and that's just is, a coincidence. Yeah, and it's not that someone physically came up and said this. It's just that we didn't see anybody else acting on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you saw someone walking around the woods, um, you know. Uh, like grabbing at fairies <laughs> you're like okay that's cool you, know, you, you would allow yourself to do that because people had this harsh reality of this everything here if i can't is, touch it it's not real yeah exactly now this is this is my momentarily reality but there's stuff beyond that well i also want to say like we look back at like uh the egyptians and other cultures and stuff and we kind of act like oh can you believe um they did this or we think in a way that they weren't this advanced society and that we are much more advanced beings when it's that's completely the opposite we're starting to realize in that. fact they were so far ahead of us these uh um civilizations before us because what, what they, they were tapping into there's, there's another concept i bring up which people aren't talking about huh were they before us oh well, yeah exactly we live in a were quantum they? universe it could be now. It could, it could be, be now. Uh, yeah. You it's know, that's a like, good point. It's like when you watch Yellow, the TV show Yellowstone, then 1883, I think it's, it's the prequel. I'm like, yeah, but they made Yellowstone before they made 1883. Yeah. And people are like, what? I'm like, we live in a quantum universe. We create the the movement of time and um, in a, um, a synchronistic a avenue. Yeah, we, we perceive it in a linear fashion. Yeah, so. Even we, though everything's all at yeah. once. But then, then you can actually say, so did they come first again? Um, because those experiences were happening, we've seen it, but I'm um, not here to, to drive anyone well, yeah. mad about this. But well, Yeah, no, yeah. that's a great point, and, and it's important because time is not linear. This is how we perceive time. Yeah. But so we have these societies that were uh, before us, after us, however you Hell, want to yeah. look at this, you know, <laughs> yeah. but essentially – we talk as if we are a much more advanced society because we created this stupid piece of plastic that runs off of light. Well, we when, became, yeah, we when, became <laughs> strong materialists. Yeah, yeah, we exactly. Everything is matter. And so we created this world and we think like, oh, you know, um, these civilizations before us, you know, uh, they were just um, – they weren't. They weren't as advanced. Uh, they didn't have the the materials. They didn't have the science. They didn't have the uh, tools to to discover uh, truth. When in fact, it, it is completely the opposite. In fact, they were so much more in tune with themselves, living um, a a much more whole life. And this is why our society is out of balance. Is we are completely living in a left brain world. We're all sitting here saying, uh, "Prove it." Prove it. It's not real. Yeah. And it's ridiculous. And this is why we're stuck in this feeling of the constant chase, the never ending, uh, the never uh, ending um, striving for happiness. We're in this weird place where we as, as a society have confused um, comfort and pleasures as happiness. Yeah. And so we just chase comfort. Pleasure, comfort, pleasure, and we say we're we're chasing happiness or we're looking for happiness. And th these civilizations before us knew these concepts way, way before we ever could. Um, and and we're tapping into these other realms and experiencing a much more whole and balanced life. And this is where we are now heading as a, as a society. We're stepping into it now. Because we are obviously me and Mike would have this show right now and talking no. about it, and we're just tapping into it. So. One thing I, I remind myself every day and everybody else, you're not doing anything wrong. You're just understanding what you're doing isn't working as efficient as it ought to be. So, again, if if you gave uh, like a four-year-old a car keys and you saw the car from them and they crashed into the the house with it, you wouldn't blame the child. 
They just didn't know how to drive the car. Yeah. So, but there comes a point where <laughs> if you're 30 years old, you're still crashing out. <laughs> I'm like, you obviously don't know the function. You had the you're keys for a while. Up. Yeah, you haven't picked up. But what happened is you didn't learn since you were four years old not to do what you do. So you keep doing it over and over. And uh, we came up with the idea of the insanity of that. And they call that karma. Yeah, but there is a point where, I'm sorry, if no one taught the... the uh, the four, eventually the 30 year old would have not crashed into the house you don't actually have another human being teach you you'll eventually get it now when we point out we go along the way and we point things out we start to move forward we start to look at like what Eckhart Casey knew back in early 1900s like wow I'm like well yeah this has been around for millennia and we look at it like wow I'm like okay it was wow but what's wow about now like what am I looking at now that I'm denying now you know, talk about this with other things. People like look back at history. I'm like, I can't believe we did that. And like, and they they're ridiculing the time and the period in which it was. And it might just be a generation to where it was their parents or their grandparents. I'm like, okay, you see that? You see what they did? What that wasn't working? What are you doing right now that you can see into 20 years that isn't working? Change that now. That's the point where I'm at. It's not about condemning the past. It's about what. Can I look into my future? And I might not. I might get 10 years down the road. I'm like, okay, that, that could have been more efficient. But I didn't know that. I had to crash into the house to realize not to crash into the house. So this is part and parcel of the whole thing. But there are things I could look at right now. And if I go to do something, I'm like, I know that's not going to work efficiently. Don't, don't do it. So 20 years now, you could have another generation looking at you. You shouldn't have done that. This is what we have right now. You have a bunch of people looking at the past. This is wrong. I'm like, okay. We did the best we could. You know, yes. We are here now. What can we, what as an individual am I looking at? How efficient am I in my day? First, go to yourself. How do I feel? I don't feel good. Take it upon yourself. Why don't you feel good? Because this, because of that what? Get yourself checked. Check yourself. And then move forward. And then you'll go through life as efficient as you possibly can. Like my car is as efficient as it can be. But there will be a moment in time where the new car will be more efficient. But I'm not waiting for that because there's always going to be more efficiency, greater, more efficiency, greater. But I have to live now. And if I don't live now, I'll never get to that greater moment. But I can only do it from the present moment. And that's what Edgar Case is teaching. When you go into that state, now you might not lay on the couch and go into a 45-minute trance. But if you sit in the moment, close your eyes, shut out the world, you can access the Akashic Records, the book of life, now for the present moment, now to know what you want to do now. Just like I access my GPS to get me somewhere. But if I don't use the first bit of information, such as make a right out of your neighborhood, I will never get there. I want to mention how we access this type of record. Because, guys, this is something I'm personally, you know... Um, I don't want to say working on, but I am. This is something, this is a huge passion for me. And so, um, like when I hear, you know. The word, a, the word is not working on, it's utilizing. Utilizing. Thank you. Because you'll, oh, you'll, it's, it's a tool. You'll always forever use the tool. But you don't have to work on hammering. You're just hammering. You're just going to get more efficient in hammering. Thank you. So, I take a, uh, uh, like what Edgar Casey's saying, you know, how he talks about this, this type of um, ability to channel. Right. And so what he's allowing himself to do is st uh, essentially fall into this moment of true silence. That's what a lot of these are all, if not all, these great teachers are really talking about. It's mm -hmm. getting so quiet that um, the the universe, the world, the God, the infinite source, it speaks to you. Yeah. OK. And so that zero point is what we're, we're trying to access to um, have these type of abilities like channeling, um, psychic abilities, telekinesis, yeah. all, all of these. Well, the zero point you mentioned. So, again, to define what channeling is. So people will mention channel is there is a third party source coming to you. Edgar Casey didn't channel. He went right to the source. Yeah, the Akashic Records. Yeah, so when you're actually doing that, you're actually in that place. So you're not really channeling. You are it. It's coming through you. But the idea, and again, this is just definitions, the idea of channeling, you have these channels out there where, like this one guy will feature him one day, Bashar. Yeah, hell yeah. His, his name is Darylenka. He's channeling 
this uh, character called Bashar is supposed to be 300 years into his future coming through Daryl Anka. Well, where was Bashar getting the information? That's where Edgar Casey was getting the information. There was no channel. It was direct. Direct source. Yeah. So as we, as we sit still, we can get, we could tap directly. We're not having um, a messenger having to come in. We're going to the actual source. And I want people to know that this isn't a, an ability you just have. This is something you practice. Well, it's like, something you actually become aware of through practice. Absolutely. You're but actually, just like meditation, people are, oh, I can't meditate. I've tried. You know, yeah. okay, what you tried 10 times to sit in a room quietly and you can't control the mind. This is just like if you were to learn the piano, okay? You will not sit down at a piano and begin to play Beethoven because you have sat in front of a piano 15 times. But no, yeah, but know this M Mozart did. Hmm. When he was a kid, you're talking about how three talented. years old. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have that capacity. So what we have to understand is, um, why people think they can't meditate or do this is because they're looking at um, like someone they looked at, like they're looking at a Maharashi Mahesh Yogi. I'm like, that, there's only one of him. You aren't to do it that way. If you want to channel or uh, pull it from source, you're trying to lay on a couch for 45 minutes. You aren't Edgar Casey. What it is, you're comparing the way you do something to somebody else, and this is why you're faltering. Stop doing that. You are channeling or you are receiving information all the time. You're just thinking like, oh, I got this information. Let me ask Mike what he thinks about it. Resistance. And Yeah. So, well, what it is is I think if it's whatever's coming through me should be coming through you. And that's not the truth. That's not the case. Every human being is going to take this information and go off in their own path. And that path, you got like a, uh, a sphere. Mm -hmm. And that path goes out, and that's the sphere of life. It's like a, a wheel. And if you look at your stream of life, it's like a spoke. Well, that hub is a source. Each spoke is what's supporting the idea of the physical life in which we all do. That becomes the outer rim. That outer rim is what actually hits the ground and has the experience. The hub is just sitting still. But when you compare yourself to that spoke, to that spoke, to that spoke, this is where we go wrong. Yeah, you might have to play the piano for eight years to learn chopsticks. Who cares? It's the process. Or you could sit down in front of it. Like I've seen videos of like a four-year-old kid playing drums like, uh, um, uh, what's a guy from Rush? Uh, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you, you can say. Neil Peart. Neil Peart. <laughs> okay, Sorry. I, I know he, he, he passed away uh, not that long ago. I see this like four or five-year-old kid just, you know, doing Tom Sawyer. I'm sorry. No one taught that kid. He came in with that, right? Like they made like David probably had a kit in the basement. And he's like, who the hell's banging on my drums? He's going down to his four year old because like that guy's like, killing it. Yeah. So <laughs> we have the capacity to come in with it, and and sometimes the process of learning uh, that over years, the process is the point. It really is. But just because Mozart was able to play the piano by three years old, that was the beginning of his life, not the end. People are looking, I want to play like Mozart. I'm like, I, I can't even play like him when he was three. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone after. Yeah. But we, we ought not to compare ourselves because we all are Mozarts. But it's that comparing. That's the resistance. That's, we that's, have to let go of all of this resistance in order to access directly yeah, It's like the Akashic pinky record. finger comparing yourself to the middle finger. Yep. Because <laughs> the middle finger is more authoritative. <laughs> more in control. It's more in control. It starts fights for in this society. Yeah. <laughs> Very powerful. But the pinky could do a bet. <laughs> Remember the it. pinky bet? Now you got the middle finger. When you, actually, the pinky bet's good, but then when you don't want to apply, when you don't want to actually, The promise, the promise. Yeah, we, and you, we, when you don't want to give the promise up, you use the middle finger. There you That's go. how you negate it. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel each other out. Yeah, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this next video clip we have for you guys, um, this comes from Edgar Casey's uh, foundation in Virginia uh, called ARE, Association of Research and Enlightenment. Um, the reason we selected this one, it um, gives you a little background about what they're doing still today, yeah. you know, about these uh, teachings, about these readings, as well as uh, I, I like this one because it talks about 
knowing thyself. And that is the crux of what Frank and I are talking about to you every episode is we we want you to know thyself. And like, again, the translation for hit the video, know thyself, know that you have the parachute on your back before you jump out of the airplane. Yeah. That's knowing thyself, knowing what your capacity is doing. Don't let anyone tell you this is what your capacity is. You will know what your capacity is and then exercise it. And when you get over those little hurdles, all of a sudden you actually start jumping um, over huge hurdles. That's it's, it. Yeah, it's the, there is no hurdle that you can't no. now uh, conquer. No, but you need a hurdle to conquer yep. in a sense. Well, that goes yeah. back to kind of the archetypes yeah. of why we come here, you know, this hero's journey that we're all on. Yeah, it's an obstacle course. It is. You know, so you don't want this in open field. You want an obstacle course. We're here to f- remember ourselves. Unless that open field has a lot of bombs in it. That's <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to the video before I say anything more ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and jump in now. When we become aware of our physical desires, we have a physical awakening. When we become aware that our minds can control the physical desires, we have a mental awakening. And when we reconcile the spirit within with the spirit without and know that they are one, we have a spiritual awakening. Because we are all one. We're all interconnected. We have to go past our physical desires and the limitations of our material world and reconcile the spirit within with that without. One of Casey's key thoughts, the spirit is the life, the mind is the builder, the physical is the result. God gives us the life, that's the energy, that's the impulse. Our minds take that impulse and frame it and use it. And the mind, as it builds, lovingly or selfishly, we're going to have the physical as a result. We reap what we sow. This is what we're doing. The study of these, through their phases and forms, and especially through any of those phases wherein the carnal or material or normal forces are laid aside and the ever-present elements of spirit and soul commune with those forces as found in each, of ent- of, in each entity. Study those and know thyself. We are a lot more complex than we may choose to believe. We need to tap into our greatness. So that was actually one of Casey's readings himself. Yeah. You saw the number there at the end. Yeah. And so when Casey channeled, um, he wasn't talking as himself. He was talking, uh, again, he he was not conscious of what he was saying. He would come out of this trance and say, you know, um, hey, did you get anything? And so these readings were all compiled and then were eventually given a number. And you can access all these readings from edwardcasey.org. And you can go in and see these. But... To see a a reading like that come through about the importance and value of knowing thyself coming directly from source, it doesn't get more powerful than that. Yeah. And see, like, you know here that that reading was at uh, 3744 slash 5. Yeah. So did you hear that story? This is pretty wild. There was Hmm. a woman, um, I don't know how long ago it was, but obviously it's way past. I think it was uh, 10 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. She was having massive digestive issues, stomach problems. She had all these issues. Oh, this is great. Dude, that was a great story. I love this. I so love this. I did this last night. <laughs> this is cool. So she was suggested by somebody to write down um, like a, a dream of like having like Edgar, in this case, Edgar Casey doing her reading. Mm-hmm. And she did that. She wrote it down the night before I went to sleep and she had a dream. Yeah, she said, write your question, right? Yeah, like, write, write your, your question, question out. And the dream came out, and in the dream, she was given a number. 
by Ed, Edgar Casey himself. Well, Ed, yeah. Edgar so came it, to yeah. her in the dream. And it, the number was a reference number of a reading he did. It was like, I've got number. 1808 or something. Eight, yeah, something like it that. It was something 18. 18. Yeah. I remember this story. And again, here's a person who had like, uh, he had 14, over 14,000 readings. So mm-hmm. 18, that's pretty early on. And what it turned out when they went into the archives, because they, they actually have this well documented. So there's actually books that you could buy. Like if you have an ailment, there's already readings based on that. You could reference that point. There might be correlation with it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she went in and she contacted Virginia Beach and uh, they said this. Oh, yeah. And they pulled it up. It so happened that the actual guy that Edgar Casey was reading had the same symptoms and same aspect. And the woman actually followed the protocol. And in four months, she was healed. That's wild. Isn't that powerful? That is wild. So last night I, I love wrote that stuff story. down, but nothing came to me. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a question down. Yeah, I don't know if it came to me. <laughs> the, the, the meaning behind that story is Edgar Casey used to say, hey, our dreams play a huge role yeah, we just in, in this experience, in this human experience. And again, this is a concept that must come to light and become more mainstream. Because I don't know about you guys, but growing up, we're taught, oh, that's just a dream. It's not real. Do you, do you dream a lot? <laughs> I don't, but that's because of a different reason. <laughs> but, <laughs> Would you like to explain? <laughs> well, well, it's the, so. Um, Remember, my mom's watching. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's. <laughs> no, dr- I, I will have. So growing up, I had very, very vivid dreams. I had. Uh, my what my mom described as night terrors okay and i would uh, she would come in or like my my dad would they would get woken up and from when i was a very young age and i'd i'd be like screaming like out of my body like type of intensity and they'd have to wake me up and growing up i used to also sleepwalk and i remember this like like um uh, very very dangerous sleepwalking like i would actually if i slept over at a friend's house i would freak out their parents because i'd be like walking around their house really in a, in a sl- <laughs> this happened with my drummer in my band oh really yeah when i was we'd all crash at his house and his mom would be like mike you were freaking me out like you're walking around everywhere you're asleep like i tried talking to you, you were mumbling actually and- by the way mike's sleeping walking right now just, <laughs> <laughs> we all are to he be honest really on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we're all sleepwalking at all times but i vividly remember this and so, like, dreams uh, were always intense for me. Um, and uh, as wow. I got older, you know, I um, I started smoking marijuana. And this helped me to fall asleep like a rock, you know, yeah. type of thing. And um, as I began to kind of, you know, analyze this, I realized, you know, the the cannabis stops the dreaming portion. I don't I've, know. If I've it, heard that. It I, is. I, it's I, like I it doesn't allow yeah. you to go into, like, this yeah. R REM cycle, you yeah. know. And um, some people, like... PTSD from war, use cannabis to fall asleep. And I believe this is a big effect as well. I think it's the type of thing where um, this allows them to not access that dream state, not have that PTSD and fall asleep and re- and feel uh, relive, rested and wakeful. Relive the experience. Yeah, yeah exactly. <clears throat> Personally, I know this is something that I... Um, want to access and so i you know on that third dimensional realm that's something i i need to you know participate in and hey you know refrain from consuming cannabis to access these dreams yeah um but dreams are an extremely important part of this waking human experience and that's what casey's talking about is he said you can you have the ability to utilize your dreams to access um, or answer any question that you may have or any type of, uh, you know, um, life moment or what you're what you're looking to have answered can be answered through the dreams. Yeah. And this is an important thing, guys, because we are not taught that growing up. We are taught that the dream isn't real. It is what it is. Oh, it's just memory. But what sub the sub our, our um, science behind the subconscious mind has taught us is how deep this subconscious goes. This subconscious is the Akashic Records. Mm-hmm. And like I was just listening to this awesome gentleman yesterday. His name is Billy Carson. Talk oh, yeah. about this. Yeah, and we got to feature him one day. We do because yeah. he's great. But he started to kind of go into like, okay, they did this experiment, and this has been duplicated in science and repeated, and it's now scientific fact because they're able to recreate the same experiment. But the scientist took a group of people, had them go out, you know, kind of walking around, doing their thing, um, 
uh, down the street, no real direction, just, hey, walk around, you know, be comfortable, be involved with um, uh, the moment, the, the community, the scene, uh, scenery you're in, et cetera. And then they brought them all back, and they started asking them about their experience. What did you see? What do you remember? Um, what street were you on? What buildings were around you? What stores were you around? And, you know, nobody had any conscious recollection of this. They were just like, oh, yeah, I remember walking here. I remember seeing a group of kids or seeing this type of event going on. So then they took this same group of people, and then they put them under hypnosis, okay? And they brought them down into what we know, know as the subconscious mind. And these same people were able to remember license plate numbers of cars that were driving by. They were able to remember the store names of a store that was, they just happened to quickly pass. They even remember the conversations certain people were having that they walked by. And that's because this experience, we are soaking in all of this information, well, everything camera. right now. Like a video yes. camera is picking up everything. And it's identical and it's uh, very specific and we can tap in and access all of this. But for the waking state and how we operate amongst this world, we don't need to remember all these things. But no. in deep hypnosis, Karen, which is you, like, <laughs> well, she has the ability to. She like, can ah, literally tap why into. Why can't you remember, remember what I tell you? I guess that. Put me in hypnosis. Say, uh, yeah. Hypnosis, and I'll remember everything. <laughs> but this is so powerful. We have able been able to prove that, like we um, have the ability to recall and remember these types of yeah. things. And so the more that we are aware of these capabilities the more we then have um, uh, less resistance to them and, to and then we can experience yeah. them so it is a it is a letting go of all of this conditioned thought you know and you do this through rewriting the program and so by putting new information like these studies and you know tests and the and listening to these lectures and speakers yeah. you 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 realize there's this whole world outside of you that you have never tapped into and it's so much more real than this work eat sleep die yeah. world that we have been taught to grow up well because what it is is and so to some level we were indirectly accessing this type of stuff so i don't know about you mike but uh and i and i knew people from other faiths i grew up with um there was a a prayer a night prayer yeah your prayer you pray at night before you went to bed yep now start to look at this differently um what i do now is when i go to bed if I go to bed and say, oh, shit, tomorrow's going to be the same as, as yesterday, I'm going into tomorrow with the same emotion, same feeling. Yeah, the day, it's, it goes from Monday to Tuesday. Tuesday's a different day, different situations, but it's the emotion I'm dragging around. But if you understand, if I say tomorrow's going to be the same as yesterday and I'm, look, I'm dreading it, that's a prayer. Now, if I go in, what do I want my day to be like? So when you set forth and set an intention into close your eyes and picture how you want it to to be and then go to sleep with that emotion that feeling you'll actually act it out in your dream even if you don't realize it and then when you wake up you then enact it so we're somewhat doing that but we weren't told this is what would happen so if we were told if you you know <laughs> we were told like Go pray that you wake up tomorrow. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like, what are you talking about? Am I not gonna wake up tomorrow? It's like, <laughs> like pray, pray you don't someone doesn't come and stab you in the middle of the night. I'm like, well, where, where's this gonna happen, right? <laughs> so, but if you were told to pray for tomorrow to be this magnificent day, just like a child right the day before their birthday, that's what they're doing. They're going to bed. Whether they're on the hands and knees with the hands folded, that's not it. You don't have to do that. But when you go into bed, like, oh, my God, and so it becomes a magnificent day. Unless they said, oh, I'm going to have a magnificent day unless it rains out. And then if it rains out, bam. You actually can't have a good day. Yeah, you can't have a good day. So when we go to bed at night, evaluate the day. Okay, how did it go? And point out, like, okay, I went wrong there. Okay, boom. No big deal. You learn a lesson. But we, right before you go to bed, close your eyes and picture how you want your day. Utilize your imagination to its fullest. Whether it happens or not, do not fret over it. And then marinate on the feeling of what it would be like to have that. And then go to bed and your dreams will be that way. That's why when you sit there and watch TV at night, and if that's your last thought, which it typically is, you actually have dreams and nightmares based on the show. But if you can actually intersect that and go to bed, okay, this is what I want to happen tomorrow. And we're talking not five years down the road. I'm talking about tomorrow, just one day. 
stay present. And then imagine all these things happening. And then all of a sudden it starts to, and if you believe they will happen, it will generate a good feeling. If you don't believe it won't happen, it won't generate a good feeling. Even though you're trying to pitch it, like, yeah, but this can happen, this can happen. Like, you got to use your imagination greater than that. Not better, but greater. And then we go to bed. It's acted out in our dream, whether you remember or not. And then we wake up with that feeling. And then an act continue going. This is what it is. It's a dream state. This is how we produce our lives. See, I love that. I um, want to share one more Billy Carson story after hearing that. So this is the one about... Um, the uh, the use of the mind. So these concepts of uh, psychic abilities, telekinesis, um, clairvoyant abilities, um, they are not far-fetched. They are not outside of us. They are not just something that um, a select few of us possess. In fact, every single one of us possesses all of these abilities and has the ability to access them. And Billy Carson was uh, gave a great example of what we're doing right now, like um, in science and in you know like uh, a corporate setting that that showcases this. And I loved it. But he showed this device that was created where you set it on your brain, or excuse me, on your head, I should say, and it, it picks up on y- your brain activity. And so it's like uh, it sits here, and then there's like a, a reader in the yeah, back like as a well. Glass or something like yeah, that. it's some yeah, it's some sort of you know it picks up on you know the brain movement, and then from the computer screen they can see the activity in the brain. You know what spots are lighting up, where they're lighting up. Mine is just blank. <laughs> it's That'd just be a good thing. <laughs> and so when they're looking at this, okay, great. Now we have a reading of this person's uh, activity within their brain. We can see what's going on. So then they have the person. Um, begin to do a series of uh, thought-generated focus. And what I mean by that is like, all right, now focus on yes. Now focus on no. Now focus on straight. Focus on um, rear. Focus on right. Focus on left. And you see what part of this brain lights up and how this works, right? And so then they took this device and they um, uh, wrote the program to connect it to a little motorized car, like a little toy car. And this lady puts on this device, and she's like, all right, I'm going to move the car forward. And she moves the car forward yeah. simply through thought. And we think this is, like, nuts. Guys, we're doing this every day. The power of our thought has the ability to travel Well, how do you think instantly. your body moves? Well, that's it. I have to say That was his example was showing move, yeah. everybody. We are simply light. We are waves of light. And as yeah. soon as we put our eyes, our observation on something, we collapse it into matter and we make it real. Yeah. And so he's showing us that, like, we already are doing this. And um, these ideas aren't far-fetched. These are these no. ideas are not crazy. We all have these abilities, and we're we are the cell phone that is a paperweight. We are using yeah. our body weights as a paper or our body as a paperweight. We have so much innate power within us that is untapped, unutilized. That when you realize what you are, you will never go back to this third dimensional uh, feeling of lack. Yeah, you and that's, so much power within you. Yeah, and that's the thing. Edgar Casey didn't have the science to back it up, but he knew. Oh, yeah. So that's what's interesting is now, like even me and Mike talking about it, we have a reference point of science. You can go take a look at it. But even with the science, if you don't enact it, if you don't experience it, you have no idea what we're talking about. Yep. But you just have to go back into a moment like yesterday and look at how things work and like, oh, that's what that was. So it's not that you didn't have experience that you didn't know that experience was actually what's happening. It's it's beyond the point of understanding. Nothing is by accident. When we're consciously aware of what's going on around us, we see how it works. When we're unconscious, we're in a default mechanism. Things work out what we consider to be preferential some days and some days not. But when we're conscious, if you slip into unconscious, all of a sudden if something didn't work out, it wasn't because I have bad luck. It was because I got distracted from the understanding where I was going. That's all. And then you can recorrect it. The thing is, when I fall off the horse, I know how to get back on the stirrups now. Where before, I didn't know how to get back on. I had to have someone help me up. Mm-hmm. Or I blame, oh, the, I, I shouldn't be riding a horse. It's like, no. Blaming the outside physical world. Yeah, it's not. Because there is really nothing outside of us. Everything is within us. That's it. And um, and that's what Edgar Casey, Casey, he would actually go within, shut out everything, and he went to a complete somber 
to where even like uh, like I said, doctors would point, hit him with needles to see if he would respond, and he didn't. So he completely detached from his corporeal motorized self. body, corporeal body, exactly. And then when he came back with the information, well, actually, when he came back, the information was always was already rendered; it was recorded. We have this access every day. So when you go to bed, you're in a, you know, depending how much sleep you do, you're in that somber. What are you going in? What's your intention before you fall asleep? Set your attention. That's important. Set your attention. That's your prayer. That's it. Set it. When you go to bed, you know, um, it's... You You want to access this, ask for the experience. Yeah, exactly. You know, like truly, you have to participate in the experience. Right. If you like, if you're a writer, if you like to write stuff down, write it down. I'll write down stuff a lot of times, but I like to just imagine a picture. I don't um, write stuff down. Even like, um, I don't know the, how true the story is because they said that by an early age, Edgar Casey um, stopped reading books. Oh, yeah. He would just access the information in a book by putting it under his pillow. Now, I tried that and I woke up with a stiff neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried that in school. Yeah, that didn't yeah, work yeah, out yeah. too well. Yeah, I'm like, teach, I slept on the, the book. The power of belief, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, so. That just shows that. By the way, that's absolutely (laughs) true. Um, Information is is carried through, you know, uh, light. It is. Now, again, the access or the, the, I should say, the process of reading a book for some people is enjoyable. So that's a great way. There isn't like a right way or wrong way to um, anything. Yeah. Because I've learned how to speed read, right? And I'll do that for the act of getting the information I need. But if I'm reading a great novel, I do not want to speed read. I want the process of getting through it. So the process of speed reading opposed to the process of just reading in a more, uh, you know, timely fashion. They're both enjoyable to me. But one has, um, like, it's, it's like me driving to California or flying. Do I want to get there quick or do I want to take my time? One isn't better than the other. It's just what do I need in the in the in the time. So yeah, when I have to read up on something for a podcast, I'll speed read for the information. But when I want to sit down and, and just enjoy the process of reading, which I, I don't that often, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just rather do other processes. Um, I would never speed read. I just sit there. Actually, I read really slow. Enjoy the experience. Enjoy, yeah. Soak Karen, it in. Karen's like you saw on that first page. I'm like. I'm no more the essence of the page <laughs> than the average person. <laughs> Real quick, Frank, tell yeah. us, um, this is one thing I want to get in about him before we uh, wrap this episode is the Akashic Records, um, what do they call that in like Catholicism or Christianity? Oh, it's yeah, the Book of Life. We all have the yeah. ways of explaining from yeah. different cultures, from different yeah, it's religions, in the Bible. all yeah. this. Yeah. It, the, the, what we're talking about, guys, is called different things in a lot of... Um, number of texts and all this type of stuff. And yeah. so you can find the correlation and this helps you to better understand as well as clear that resistance and, yeah. and realize what you're stepping into, what you're accessing, not only is a real and true thing, but has been spoken about for thousands of years. Yeah. And if you question this, by all means question, do not, do not let me tell you there's a parachute on your back. I do want to say this though. A lot of us walk around wearing this, um, idea that I am a real I am a realistic person as a badge of honor and this is holding you back from that next level I personally did this you yeah, know I'm no, like oh I'm really realistic but, about this but know this this is not outside the realm of realistic absolutely not. it really isn't it's just that it's foreign to us but the cell phone is realistic now but 50 years ago it wasn't so when you actually start to look at that holy shit so again you find the realisticness in it, if that's even a word. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not saying uh, don't be skeptical of certain situations no, yeah. because we are navigating this world. And I understand that you must operate in this world. You can get physically hurt in this world. Like, we're well, not you, saying anything like how, that. This is how cults start. Yes. We don't want to start yes. a cult. You, I want you to come to a, a realization of this information, how it applies to your life. And then what it does, what happens is, you create a broader perspective in like what they call the quantum physics, the wave. And when you're actually in the field of a wave, and okay, I got this wave, and okay, I want to experience that, zoom, now you create the particle. Yep. But you're creating a particle. You're not purchasing a particle for somebody else. Yep. There's a difference. You create your own particle, I'll create my own particle, and this is what makes up the world. I just want people to know that this idea of being realistic, this idea of being, you know... Um, guarded or you know uh skeptical is it's, not, a, it's more pes- it, it's more pessimistic yeah it keeps you 
from, from experiencing a lot in yeah, life. Expanding, yeah. So just tear that. I it, had to get through that personally. That's the reason I yeah. bring that up is oh, I yeah. used to wear it like, oh, no, I'm a realistic person. And I realized, it. dude, yeah. And Prove I'm like it. sitting here going, my resistance to these concepts are what are holding them back from me. Yeah. And, and as I began to let go more and more of this, I began to experience more and more of what Frank and I are talking about and what, you know, these great mystics are talking about and from a very personal and deep level that I know is truth. And so I just want to, you know, share my experience and say, guys, loosen up a little bit, you know, you know, you don't have to go out and tell people like all this, this is a slow walk into this type of stuff, but I'm telling you, it's not only worth it, but you're, you'll begin to access this whole other side of this world and you'll see what we have been missing out growing up in a Western culture being taught, you know, um, that anything um, inside of us is not the truth. Only the things outside of us are the truth. Yeah. And also through the process of becoming a materialist, going into a um, um, like more of the energy field. It's the duality of it, too. So some part of actually fully investing in the material world will send you into the spirit world. So it's like. To some level, like wow, it was wild coming from the material world going to spirit world because now I know. And so sometimes you have to trip and fall to know you can get up. But if you've never fell, the idea of getting up would be a weird concept. Like, dude, you know, and I fell so many yeah. times. <laughs> I, I still do. I just I don't. The thing is, I don't focus on falling anymore because I know how to get up, and That's I seldom it. fall. But if I'm you know wherever we look, there we go. So, you know, someone's like, don't look down. I'm like, why would you say that? If you don't want someone to look down, have them look forward or straight up. Yeah. Say look forward. Yeah. But nonetheless, this is kind of what we hear about talking about perspective shift. That's it. As you slowly open up, you're shifting your perspective in your degree in which you ought to do it. No one should tell you how to look at something. Me and Mike are offering up multitudes of perspectives. That's why we're featuring different people on a weekly basis now. So whatever resonates with you, explore that, explore that and just take whatever it is you get from it and then drop it into your own pond and watch the ripples. Don't try to jump on anyone else's bandwagon. That's it. You you have your own wagon. That's it. Yeah. And that's the shift we're here. Hell yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining us this week, guys. Uh, yeah. Edgar Casey. Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet. <laughs> oh, loved yeah. it. Um, next week, uh, we'll see who we're diving into. Frank and I will choose that this week. Yeah. But um, thank you guys for joining us here. If you have any questions about anything you heard today or just in general, feel free to leave us a comment or shoot us an email. Um, don't forget to subscribe at the link below. Yeah. And also, too, uh, catch us on Perspective Shift uh, 2020 is our email. Yep. Uh, gmail.com gmail.com yep yeah and if anyone if there is anyone out there within this realm of uh understanding that you want us to dive into that me and mike might not know about great please idea. let us know please and we we'll, would love that help we'll, expand our horizons yeah exactly because you know um my i'm mine is narrowed as far as i can expand but yep. i want to expand it even more all right love that peace out see you next week right. guys